Hi everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where you always learn something new. And I'm joined today by our co-host, good friend, coming to us from England, but she's Scottish, don't get that wrong. We've got with us <laughs> Leslie Price. She's with www.learnappeal.com. Manning the video switcher and audio, we've got Harold Mugliotti, and we've got Elaine Morley as a guest today. Shall we get started? Let's go for it. And we are back and joining us in that center position of power, as we like to call it. We've got Elaine Morley. She has a long history in the world of training, e-learning, development, managing people, as opposed to other things. But <laughs> she's got a good background, and we'd love to have her here. Elaine, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for inviting me today. Oh, you're more than welcome. I'm glad you could join us. And you do have a good background. You've got a really nice background in all sorts of things, training. And, and today you wanted to talk a little bit about something we haven't talked a lot about, and that's really knowledge sharing among peers and among people that you work with and sharing information, sharing other things. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's been one of your pleasures in, in the world of training? Well, I would say what, what really drives me and, and uh, gets me up in the morning is I love to help other people be successful. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, that reaches not only our typical avenues of training, but what we're going to talk about today, which is, again, supporting associates, sharing their knowledge. Um, I've been blessed to work with some really smart people. And so, you know, whether it's technology SMEs or business SMEs, um, giving them an opportunity to grow their skills by sharing their knowledge in various ways, I think is a really great um, fit into overall learning and development plans. Kind of like the old saying that rising tide lifts all ships. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Oh, I thought Leslie um, was going oh, I thought Leslie was about to say something. No, 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 no I'm okay. just listening. I, I'm no, I'm just listening and agreeing because um, that that I would say too is is one of the things that I think is incredibly important. I mean, we're looking for um, we're going to be taking on an intern, for example, over the over the summer period, and I filled in the form today, and it was looking for what skills do you need, and also. Um, what do you, you know? What do you not want? What should what should what behaviours should the interns not have? And I said, you know, that listening and engaging was actually really important. That it's not mm -hmm. just you imparting knowledge; it's actually listening to other people who have knowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I think. Um, in the experience I've had too, a lot of technologists, so I focused a lot on technology training. Um, I've done some leadership and soft skills also, but a lot of technologists have really deep knowledge that's great for other people to know, but they may not be that comfortable sharing that knowledge initially. It's not a skill that they maybe um, have innately. So I think the more we can help them bring that out, the better it is for them because they can create that social capital where they become known as thought leaders. And it also, of course, benefits the organization because they're sharing uh, a lot of the general knowledge they have, but also how to apply that to that particular corporation in the work that they do. And also when you're communicating, um, it's important to communicate in a language that other people understand. And very often people who are you know, involved in learning technologies or are techie themselves, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of the things that they say might actually go over other people's heads. So I think, it, you know, communication skills and learning from others mm -hmm. and listening is actually really important. So it's going to be good to chat to you today. Absolutely. Now, you, brought a, you, you sent us a slide to show. Would you like to, yes. Harold, do you want to show yes. the slide? I'm just going to ask you to pull that up, please. There are um, 
five ways that I wanted to kind of highlight for different ways I've leveraged the associates sharing their knowledge. And so if it's all right with you, I'm just going to jump right into those. Sure. Um, on the left, I'm talking about a post-conference panel, but really panels of subject matter experts for any type of learning. And I want to share a couple examples with you of, of what um, I've done in some of the learning programs that I've designed. Um, I think it's, again, beneficial when you're creating an overall program is, you know, not only having the formal training, but also having some of the social learning and, again, um, giving people a way to interact and engage in different ways. One scenario um, that we used to run into often is we'd have these industry standard conferences and some of them were really popular. Um, one, for instance, was the AWS reInvent conference and that's around the cloud technology, Amazon's cloud technology. And we would get 50 people asking to attend the conference and it just didn't make sense cost-wise or time-wise to send that many people to the same conference. So what we started doing is, you know, the uh, leaders would choose who would go to the conference, but then we would hold post-conference panels. And so we would invite the people that did go to share the knowledge that they had gained and more importantly, share the insights that they had. So a lot of times they were the thought leaders across our organization for that particular topic. And so they could not only share what they had learned at the conference, but actually put um, a very specific spin on it or share some thoughts they had on how the company could leverage what they had learned. So it actually took what they learned at the conference and, and went one step further. Now, how did, that, how did that work on the whole for you? It worked really great. Um, one of the things we found is when we engaged a panel of our own um, experts, or our own associates, people really, um, really liked that. And they, they especially wanted to hear, well, okay, that's great, but how do we apply it here at this company? Mm. Um, another example, a little bit different, is I designed a Women in Technology Day where we invited um, women throughout the technology organization to come together to network and learn and, and really create or build a community so that they could support each other. And um, I had an author come in, Kim Faith. She was our keynote speaker, and she talked about her new book at the time called Your Lion Inside. And that really talked about how to tap into your inner strength. And we really wanted um, the women to understand how do you come out of your comfort zone and how do you actually leverage your innate strengths so that you can be the best um, person that you can be. And so one of the things we added after the keynote speaker talked about her book is we had a panel of senior technology um, leaders, they were females, who really talked about what their journey was like to get to that senior level. And they had a preview of the book, so they were able to also, um, again, tie it in specifically to what did they relate to in the book and, and how did they um, maneuver their career. And again, just you know, give them that extra layer of um, bringing it home to uh, something that impacted the organization. It's really that's really interesting. Have you um, with the, especially with the women in in technology, have you noticed that there's now um, a LinkedIn group about women in learning and development? It, it might. Oh, be I didn't. You. Yeah, it, it's my my friend and colleague Kate Kate Graham is quite involved in it. But have a look. Um, I, I've got your email address now, so I'll send you I'll send you a link. But it's about. Um, women in L and D, and a lot of, obviously a lot of the women there too are into tech. Are, you know, are into technology, and there is, um, you know, the, there's been various women in technology events recently, mm -hmm. and oh. to try and help build women's, mm -hmm. con you know, confidence, because yep. when you look in an IT department, you know most of the people in the IT department are actually men, not women. And yep. the same applies within learning and development. In HR, you get far more women, but mm -hmm. in learning and development, you get less, particularly mm -hmm. sort of learning technologies. Yes. So I'll send you yes. the link. Yes. That'd be great. I'd love to see it. 
Okay. Um, let me just share one more example of the panel and then we'll move on. Um, we did something a little more fun um, with another example. So when I designed the cybersecurity uh, month long campaign last October, we had a lot of different activities. We had, you know, e-learning modules, we had videos, we had um, assessments and games. And one of the things we did is we had a panel of parents who actually just talked about how to keep your kids safe online. So one of the challenges that the organization was having around cybersecurity is not many people were engaging. It's like we couldn't even get them to show up to events or be really interested in you know, taking ownership of making sure that our environment was safe was, you know, we, we couldn't even get to that point because we couldn't even get them engaged. So we decided to have a, you know, a panel, as I said, of parents so that we could really reach anyone in the organization, whether they were technical or not. And that was a great hit. People loved that. So we had a panel of associates. They were all parents, but they all fit a little different um, box for you know their parenting. And that was just a, a great thing that people loved. We got a lot of really good feedback on that one too. That, that's good. Uh, the next thing I wanna move on to is uh, SME generated playlists. So when I um, was working with O'Reilly Safari, if you haven't heard of that, that is a learning um, platform. So 24 seven, a lot of videos, books, um, a lot of different uh, courses, and they have the ability of creating playlists. So when we first brought that tool into our company, our L&D team created a few of the playlists to kind of get things started, and we'd market those playlists for some of the topics that were really important to our organization. But what we did as a second step is we encouraged the SMEs or the thought leaders to create their own playlists and share those across the organization. So again, those subject matter experts were able to really hone in a little closer to exactly what would benefit our organization in the different topics. And so we had some great playlists. One, for example, was for DevOps. We were just starting to migrate to DevOps. So um, one of the transition leaders created a playlist for DevOps that we were able to share out. Uh, another example is one of our architects created a summer reading list. And we had quite a lot of people following these playlists. And we looked at the data for the um, usage of that particular tool. And the items that were in the playlist were consistently the items that were accessed most often. So it was really a success for us. It's actually clever. It's a fun idea, too, because people are used to, on the web, creating their own playlists. You go to YouTube and create your own playlists, your own lists of things, and why not take advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, not a lot of LMSs still allow you to create playlists or any anything else, which is nice to have. It's definitely nice to get that kind of social media feel to, to things. Mm -hmm. and. How did the playlist do on the whole as far as, as people's involvement? Were they really getting into it? Yes, so um, you're right. Our LMS would not allow us to add the playlist um, to the LMS itself. What we did is we had a uh, Google, we were a Google um, corporation, so we had a Google, <laughs> a Google site <laughs> that mm -hmm. we uh, used to market the O'Reilly product and then we listed the playlists right on there so that people could come to that site, not only um, request a license and get general information about it, but they could click right on the playlists there. And that really was helpful. Um, but I agree with you. I think it'd be great if more LMSs allowed um, SMEs or just associates to add some content. I understand some do. Um, I haven't used um, eLogic, but I understand um, that's an example of one that allows associates to add some content. So, um, you know, there are some, I think, out there that do that. We just didn't happen to have one that did. Now, what, what did you find as far as the, not the thought leaders, if you will, but the people who were just watching or, or taking advantage of the playlists, did a lot of them create their own playlists to share? Um, we, we did. We had, well, I'll, I'll say this. A lot more people created their own playlists than shared them. 
Okay. So I know from just talking to people that people were definitely creating their playlists. Um, we kept trying to encourage them to share them so that other people could benefit from them. So, you know, it was, you know, maybe 10% of the people that created playlists actually shared them. Hmm. Um, but it was really uh, embraced. That's good. Did well, the that, middle icon. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it just, I was just the middle kidding. icon is around communities of practice. And this is one of my favorite things. Um, I launched a community of practice program. Oh, I think it's about three years ago now. And that really is our linchpin for social learning. And all these other things on this slide really kind of play in very nicely to our communities of practice. And so we created the communities of practice to allow our associates to learn, collaborate, and network. And really one of the main focuses was to break down the silos, not only the organizational silos, but also the geographic silos. So we were in over 100 countries. And so it really was a way for people to connect with each other, share knowledge, um, and really just engage with each other when they typically wouldn't have worked you know, with as many people across the organization. At one time we had as many as nine communities of practice for some technology topics like agile, um, AI, cloud, but we also had um, communities of practice for some of the soft skills. For instance, we had a global communications community of practice. So again, the importance of how to communicate not only um, in general, but on a global scale to make sure that people uh, can relate to what you're uh, talking about or what you're communicating. And then um, we also had a career development community of practice that was very um, active. And we even had an HR people analytics community of practice. And that was actually a pretty new topic. When they launched the HR uh, people analytics, we actually didn't have any SMEs internally. It was such a new topic that we didn't have any expertise. So that community in practice actually invited a lot of external speakers to webinars and, and some of the interactions that they had so that as a whole organization, we could really come up to speed on that particular topic. Now, I'm curious, you had a lot of countries involved. It's a, a distributed company. Did you find that some mm -hmm. countries just weren't as eager or culturally used to sharing, collaborating as much? Were there, were there differences that, that you guys noticed between some and other countries? I think one of the things I noticed is some countries, they're a little more timid about sharing their opinion if they're not in a formal leadership role. Mm. Um, so that was something that we really had to encourage people to do is, you know, you don't have to be an expert. Your opinion or your questions still have a lot of value. So we really had to encourage that. And then the other thing too is um, what one of the other topics I guess we dove a little deeper into um, was curating effectively. Mm -hmm. So not just sharing a link to an article or to a white paper um, because that's you know it has some value but not as much as if you actually give it context. So yeah. you know layered in that we were teaching our associates when you are sharing information, give it that perspective of either what's your knowledge that you can add on top of it, or how do you see our company leveraging what this article or this white paper is talking about? So I think by giving that um, safer thing of curation, as opposed to creating your own content, we were able to loop some more people in that maybe would have been a little hesitant about doing that. That's good. Did you find that? What kind of oh, go ahead, Leslie. did you? Yeah, what kind of format do your do your communities of practice take? Because um, very often, if you if you if you just use like chat forums, for example, or I mean, I can think of loads of different chat forums. Mm -hmm. They're sometimes not as active as they could be, mm -hmm. and it needs somebody there managing it and encouraging chat rather than just mm -hmm. relying on people to chat amongst themselves. Is that, yes. does that make sense to you? Absolutely makes sense. So um, what we did is we designed a framework for how the communities of practice should work. And what that included is that there was a sponsor for each of the communities of practice. And the sponsor was usually either a senior leader or someone that was really recognized and respected for that particular topic. 
And so their job was to kind of oversee the community of practice, not to command and control over it, but to give some insights they might have and, and to make sure that they kept moving forward and to encourage them and to recognize them when they were successful. And then we had a council and the council was really associates that volunteered to lead that particular community of practice for a while. And so the council would, number one, decide what was gonna be the focus. So a topic like agile or um, cloud or any of, the, any of the topics, professional development, there's so many different directions you can take it. And we didn't want people to get lost in such a broad topic. So the council would survey their members to find out kind of where do they want to focus on and then they would actually write a charter so that people knew exactly what they were going to focus on for that time and then they would be the ones that would lead webinars and they would do in-person events at some of the offices um, but we did have the g plus conversation part of it too and what we found is um, each community of practice could set their own uh, schedule for when they met and and what those sessions looked like but then the G plus was great for in between meetings so some of the examples that we saw that that had a good impact is a person might have uh, well here's a real example um, someone in the data analytics and reporting community of practice had written on G plus that they were having problems even opening a file um, at the time in Excel because the file was so big, Excel wouldn't even open it. Or if it opened hmm. it, it would take like 20 minutes to open. And so somebody in that particular community of practice said, you know what, I use typical Spotfire. That's a perfect thing to solve your problem. They actually connected and the one associate taught the other one exactly how to use what um, he needed out of the typical Spotfire um, product. So they solved a real business um, solution or real <laughs> business problem. And that came about through the chat that they were able to just reach out to each other. Now, Elaine, what is what is Spotfire? It is a visualization tool. So um, if you think of a report where you might have a lot of different graphs laid out on, let's say, mm -hmm. a single page, you can have multiple pages. Um, we used it, by the way, for our training uh, metrics and reporting. And so you could have these graphs, but they were interactive. So you could build it so that you had filters and you could make adjustments on the fly. So I could create my, um, my analytics for learning and a leader could come in, click on their name to filter it, and it would just filter automatically down to just their data. Nice. And so there's a lot of interactive um, components to it, and, and it really made it so nice to create a little more generic view where people could still um, zero in on it. That sounds good. I have to check it out. Yeah, you learn something yeah. new every day. <laughs> so. That's what you learned. <laughs> it was good too. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> I hadn't heard of that one. I was going, that's Spotfire. That sounds interesting. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. It was a good tool for us. Right. Um, one of the other things I mentioned on this particular slide is the train the trainer. So, you know, as we talked at the beginning of the session, a lot of the people that have the expertise maybe don't have the knowledge or experience to lead a good session if they're trying to transfer their knowledge or they're trying to lead a learning session. And so we did bring in a train the trainer course. And we focused on instructor-led virtual as the way um, we did the train the trainer. Again, because we were in over 100 countries, it was so rare that you ever did a session that was just for people in your local office. So we taught them how to think like a trainer and how to behave like a trainer so that when they did lead their own sessions, they were, um, more familiar with some of the basic adult learning principles. They um, were taught how to do some questioning and how to do some activities to make sure that the knowledge um, was really um, transferred to the learner and that the learner knew how to actually apply it to what they needed to do with it. So having those train the trainer sessions was really helpful for the subject matter experts or the, um, sometimes they were just regular associates who had been assigned to you know, lead some learning around a particular tool that they used. Um, so that was really something that was helpful. It made them a lot more comfortable 
and it just I think gave them um, the ability to lead a, a richer session because very often all too often people assume that they can teach they can train you know they've watched people do it you know they've sat in a classroom um, yes. from when probably they were like five years old and then all mm -hmm. the way through university or what you would call college and they but it's actually a skill set in itself mm -hmm. yes it is it definitely is and uh, you know I think some people just think if I just do a brain dump if I just tell you everything I know about a topic that's teaching you <laughs> and of course we yeah. know that's not the case so uh, I think it really made them stop and think about it and prepare better ahead of time when they were leading a session that they did want to teach a particular topic. I mean, the other thing that people make assumptions about is that when you're doing virtual sessions, that the skills you need for a virtual session, sort of to be a, a, a virtual trainer, you know, virtual online learning, to actually do that, they think it's the same skill set as you need mm -hmm. as you're standing up in front of a classroom. <laughs> and it's absolutely yes. not. It's a different no. skill set. No, there in are fact, similarities. A, and a lot of trainers that get into the, uh, the online method of training really suffer. They struggle with it because they're not seeing the people. They've got to rely on their voices. They've got to do a lot of things differently. And they're not getting the feed usually. You can, there are ways to yeah. simulate feed, but it's not the same as being in a classroom. And right. it's tough to get people into that mindset when they're not used to it. It, it's a lot mm -hmm. of practice. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. It is, it is, it is, to me, it is a separate um, skill set. I know mm -hmm. that, I mean, one of my very good friends, um, Joe I think Cook. you met her when you were Joe Cook. learning technology. Yeah, Joe Cook. Joe Cook. Yeah, she she's great. Absolutely amazing at mm -hmm. it. She really is fantastic. And say, you know, Elaine, it, it, she's another person that it's worth looking up. Um, light bulb Joe is her name on on twitter and she talks about you know i think it's light. I, I think her site is light bulb moment but she teaches live online learning facilitation skills and i mean she is very good wouldn't you agree rick i, I would she actually is good in person and on, on computer online so yeah it's a good skill yeah. set and it's it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to train yeah. via a hybrid method like that blended learning mm -hmm. it just they it, what a lot of people don't realize is you just got to practice it and get, until yeah. you get good at it don't think you're good at it it takes practice yes yes very true all right well i made a note to look her up so thank you for sharing that okay. <clears throat> uh, the last thing i'll say that actually leads me into the um, last one is what i've noticed in my uh, experience is technologists get so excited about the technology that they want to teach them everything they know so you know they are just so excited about every nuance of the technology they often want to overload the people that they're trying to teach and so whether it's um, in the train the trainer course that we talk about really deciding you know what is your goal what's what's the end result that you're looking for and, and to stay focused on that that also is true for the last item, which is the SME owned content. So one of the things that we found is a lot of our subject matter experts wanted to just create their own content. So um, a couple of years ago, we started really consulting and coaching them to do that. So that would um, really in entail a few things. Uh, the typical scenario is you know, a, a technologist, for instance, might reach out to me because they had a new tool. They wanted to go ahead and just own their own content and really wanted to just understand what are some basic adult learning principles? You know, what should they be doing or not doing? Um, so again, helping them understand who really is your audience and, and define that up front and also defining what their goal is so that they didn't um, kind of wander from it and, and include too much information. Um, also talking through things like, you know, is the course going to be mandatory for them to get onto the um, software product if it was a tool that they were teaching on or was it just going to be recommended? And a lot of that would be discussions where we'd have to bring some of the leaders in. 
So, you know, I think everyone loves, or at least the technologists would love to think, oh, this is going to be mandatory. We're not going to give them access to this tool unless they take my training. But when you really talked through it with them, um, it, that wasn't necessarily the right um, approach that sometimes when you made a course mandatory, people were less likely to want to pay attention and want to learn from it. So yes, they might, you know, click on it and kind of walk through it, but not pay that much attention to it. Um, we tried to encourage them to create learning that people really wanted to take and not necessarily have to make it mandatory. It's the other like thing is, back um, to as soon as you're as soon as you're told you have to do something, you, yes. you know, it's almost like your brain switches off. <laughs> right, right. Yep. And you know, when you're looking at a large company, just the number of um, hours that you're saying that people have to take required courses, you know, that costs the corporation a lot of money. So, you know, if it's a 20 minute course but you've got hundreds of people that you're trying to say you have to take it, that's costing the corporation a lot of money. So, you know, you have to be sensitive about that too. That's true. Well, Elaine, we're actually at the end of our time. We, we did it early for a change. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Elaine, it's been a real pleasure having you on and having you share what, what your experiences have been. And there's some great ideas and what you were talking about. So. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, any final comments on from you, Leslie? No, it's just it's actually just good to hear somebody like-minded sharing what what they're doing. Yeah. Well, thank you both for having me today. I've enjoyed the chat. Great. And if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Um, at the bottom is my LinkedIn um, site. Otherwise, I can share my email address. It's EJ Morley. 12 at gmail.com so they can okay, feel free to email me also and we'll have your linkedin on the links below on the show notes sure. so again thanks for sharing with us and leslie uh by the way i don't know if i said in the beginning but leslie's with www.learnappeal.com i may have missed that but i thought about that if not you got it twice today well, minimum. It's, it, it, it's exciting times we are just about starting a new project in malawi this week cool very nice next week will start. Yeah. very good it's a great great project if you haven't heard about it folks learnappeal.com we'll see you next week on e-learn chat have a good one everyone thanks thanks bye. thanks everyone bye bye, bye. And that's a wrap.